Marvel's Avengers Phase 1, Thor, adapted by Alex Irvine. Prologue They've always asked questions, this race called man on this planet called Earth, passionately longing to know how they are connected to the heavens. In ages past, they looked to us as gods, for indeed so many times we saved them from calamity. We tried to show them how their world was but one of the nine realms of the cosmos, linked to all others by the branches of Yggdrasil, the world tree. Nine realms in a universe of wonder, beauty, and terror that they barely comprehended. But for all their thirst for knowledge, they let our knowledge, they let our lessons, fall into myth and dream. The mighty Thor, where did he, the one whom the humans call the God of Thunder, come from? He came from us, the proudest warriors the worlds have ever seen. He came from this, the greatest realm the universe has ever known. Thor came from Asgard, and these are his tales. The All-Father's Fear the Allfather did not act without thought. Now, as the sun shone over Asgard and the buildings were illuminated by its rays, gleaming like gold, he thought long and hard. At the realm's edge, the darkness of the cosmos spread out like a calm sea. Asgard was at peace, and all was ready for the momentous events to come. Standing in his chambers, Odin stared out at the realm he had ruled for so many years, Despite the beauty before him, his mind was troubled and his expression drawn with worry and tension. As Allfather, Odin had battled great beasts, invaded foreign realms, destroyed strong enemies, and kept the realm of Asgard safe and peaceful. He had lost his brothers and father to war. For thousands upon thousands of years, he had carried the burden of his crown alone. It had wearied him at times, energized him at others. When he had married his wife, Frigga, the burden had lifted, as she was a strong partner and had a helpful ear. And with the birth of his first son, Thor, Odin had felt hopeful that one day he would be able to pass along his crown to a worthy successor and find the peace he so rightly deserved. Now that day had finally come, for today Thor would become king. Yet Odin did not feel a sense of relief. With a deep sigh, he turned from the wide doorway that led out to his chamber balcony. Behind him, the two giant statues of his fallen brothers standing outside the palace framed his tired body, dwarfing him, while at the same time hinting at his great might and heritage. He was not yet dressed for the evening, still in the golden robes that he would soon exchange for his ceremonial gear. But his hair was combed and his face freshly shaved. Odin's shoulder-length hair was no longer the blonde of his youth, but the gray suited him, and he still had the bearing of a great warrior and powerful leader. Queen Frigga sat at her vanity, putting on her jewelry. In the reflection, she saw her husband turn and come back into the center of the room. His blue eyes were dark with worry, and she felt a now long familiar rush of love. She had married a warrior, but knew him as so much more than that. He did not rule lightly. Everything he had done and everything he would do was the result of great reflection. He had seen the results of battles that had not been thought out and had lost too many warriors to unnecessary violence. And so she knew that he had thought long and hard about this day. While some argued that Thor should have assumed the throne years ago, Odin had seen the benefit in waiting. He wanted his son to follow in his footsteps and the footsteps of his father before him, to keep Asgard safe and free of war. Yet, Thor was not his father. Thor was impulsive and hot-headed. He still had much to learn about the value of patience. Alas, Odin had no more time left to teach. He was growing weaker by the day. Soon he would need to enter the Odin sleep, during which he would be unable to rule, his body in a state of suspended animation while he used the powerful Odin force to rejuvenate. Feeling his wife's gaze on him, Odin looked up and smiled, the corners of his eyes crinkling. She continued to amaze him. 
Her beauty was beyond compare, and while servants rushed about in preparation below, she sat calmly, her back straight and her head high. Now more than ever, he needed her strength. Do you think he's ready? Odin asked, his voice deep with emotion. She looked at him and nodded slowly. Thor has his father's wisdom, she said, knowing that was what he needed to hear. But Odin's expression remained worried, so she added, He won't be alone. Loki will be at his side to give him counsel. She stood up and approached her husband. Loki, their younger son, was a source of tension between them. Odin had always favored Thor because Thor was a warrior just like him. But Loki was not, and so his younger had formed a closer bond with Queen Frigga. But in a way, that had been a good balance. Loki was Thor's opposite quiet, thoughtful, and content to stay in the shadows. Frigga hoped that Odin would see the benefit of having the brothers side by side. He reached out a hand about to caress her cheek, but he stopped suddenly. Odin's hand was shaking. The Allfather stood staring at it with fierce concentration as though willing it to stop. If only we had more time, Odin said when his hand finally stopped shaking. I can fight it a little longer. Frigga held up a hand. No, you've put it off too long, she said harshly. Then her expression softened. I worry for you. Odin cocked his head, a playful smile tugging at his lips. I've destroyed demons and monsters, devastated whole worlds, laid waste to mighty kingdoms, and still you worry for me? Always, Frigga answered truthfully. She knew what he was capable of but she still feared that Thor's new role would be Odin's undoing. But she didn't have to worry. Her words had reassured her husband as they always did, and now, for better or worse, he was ready to pass the throne on to his elder son. In a few short minutes, the mighty Thor would succeed his father and become the new king of Asgard. All attention would be on him, just as he liked it. No one would notice Thor's younger brother, no one would notice Loki the trickster, and that's just the way Loki liked it. Loki paused behind thick curtains as he made his way toward the elaborate throne room. For now it was quiet, with no sign of the large crowds of Asgardians who would soon fill the space. It was just Loki. On his head he wore his great helmet, its two horns rising up and then curving like a ram's. He was dressed in his finest clothes and wore his signature green cape. He soaked in the silence and for a moment imagined that it was he who would walk down the aisle to kneel in front of Odin and ascend to the throne of Asgard. He imagined thunderous applause and saw his mother glowing with pride as he stood, ready to rule. Hearing the sound of loud footsteps, he shook off the fantasy and turned. His brother was striding down the long hall toward him. Towering over even the tallest of Asgardians, his chest broad and his shoulders straight, Thor held Mjolnir in his hand as he walked, and his long red cape flowed out behind him. Even Thor's helmet seemed more powerful than Loki's, its wings catching rays of sun and looking perfect atop his golden locks. Nervous, brother, Loki said when Thor came to a stop in front of him. His eyes were teasing, he knew that Thor never got nervous. How do I look? Thor asked, ignoring his brother's question. He adjusted his red cape and ran a hand over his armor. He may not have been nervous, but he did want to make sure that he looked the part. He had been waiting for this day for years. Nothing could spoil it for him now. Like a king, Loki answered, his eyes flashing. Thor gave him a quizzical look. Loki's answer had been honest, but his tone had held a hint of something he couldn't quite read. Jealousy? Anger? Envy? His younger brother had always been something of a mystery to him. While Thor had been eager to spread his wings, fight in battles, and go off on grand adventures, Loki had always been more hesitant. True, he had Thor's back, but it was often only out of necessity. So why would Loki be jealous now? He couldn't want the throne for himself, could he? 
As if sensing Thor's hesitation, Loki smiled, erasing the fire in his eyes and replacing it with affection. Then, to Thor's amusement, he turned to a servant passing by with a goblet full of wine. The wine morphed into a swarm of writhing eels that slithered up the servant's hand and arm. The servant let out a scream and dropped the goblet, which clattered to the ground. Instantly, the eels disappeared and were replaced by spilled wine. Thor laughed, reassured. Loki was a trickster and a magician. He did not want to be king. Then Loki spoke, confirming Thor's thoughts. I've looked forward to this day as long as you have, he said, his voice serious. You're my brother and my friend. Sometimes I'm envious, but never doubt I love you. Suddenly a horn blasted. It was time for the ceremony to begin. Inside the throne room, Asgardians had gathered to bid farewell to their current king and welcome their new one. Ceremonial banners fluttered from the high ceilings while attendants handed out golden goblets full of sweet drinks to the beautifully dressed guests. There was a festive air to the room as people chatted softly to each other and waited with eager anticipation for the arrival of the royal family. At the front of the room, Thor's best friends and fellow warriors, Volstagg, Fandral, Hogan, and Lady Sif, stood at attention while members of the palace guard lined up in formation. Then Frigga entered the room and walked down the long aisle, Loki by her side. Her hair cascaded over her shoulders and down her back in ringlets that matched her golden gown. When they had made their way to the front of the room, another horn sounded, and the guards stepped aside. There was an audible gasp. Odin sat atop his golden throne. On his head he wore a large helmet, and in his hand he gripped the mighty spear Gungnir. Looking out over the room, Odin sighed deeply. Even after ruling for tens of thousands of years, he felt as if it were only a day ago that his father had crowned him in a ceremony similar to this one. He wondered now if his father had had the same doubts about him that he was having about Thor. Did he regret having to step aside for the younger generation to take over? Odin thought. Was I as impulsive then as Thor is now? Does that mean that he too will grow into a wise king in time? Odin's thoughts were interrupted by another gasp from the crowd. Then the room erupted in applause. The mighty Thor had arrived. Thor raised Mjolnir, the hammer that only the worthy could lift, high over his head and soaked in the adoration. His body was covered in battle armor with large metal discs on the front chest plate. His winged helmet sat on his head, and his long red cape flowed behind him. While moments ago everyone had believed Odin to be the most powerful ruler they would ever have, the appearance of Thor made them believe otherwise. Standing there, he looked every inch a king. When the cheering faded, Thor finally strode up the long aisle, a smug smile on his face. Clearly, the concerns of his father did not trouble Thor. He felt more than ready to rule Asgard. He had watched his father do it for years, and he thought it was time for a fresh start. He had proven himself to be one of the finest warriors the realm had ever seen. Now he would prove himself to be one of its finest kings. As Odin watched his son walk toward him, the gravity of the situation hit the All-Father hard. Though sometimes brash and irresponsible, Thor had grown into a fine young man, and now he was about to take the throne as the new ruler of Asgard. Odin could still vividly remember when Thor was just a boy, learning how to hold a sword for the first time, or when he was first able to wield Mjolnir, how the hammer, which now looked small in his large hands, had nearly toppled Thor. Odin smiled now, thinking back on that day. Learning to be king would be like learning to ride a horse. Thor wouldn't like having to go slowly, and he would fall a few times. But his difficulties would serve to teach him some valuable lessons. Or so Odin hoped. He could be only grateful that the realm was at peace and had been for a long time. There was no doubt Thor was a good warrior, but a warrior king? That was another story. 
That was something he had yet to learn. Finally, Thor arrived in front of his father. He nodded at his mother and brother and friends, and then knelt, bowed his head, and waited. A hush fell over the crowd as they too waited. A new day has come for a new king to wield his own weapon, Odin began, his deep voice echoing through the room. Today, I entrust you with the sacred throne of Asgard. Responsibility, duty, honor. They are essential to every soldier and every king. As the Allfather spoke, Thor raised his eyes to look at him. Odin willed the words to impact his son, to get through to him. For after this day, he would be on his own. Odin continued, repeating the declaration that had been spoken to him so many years before. He was at the very end of his speech when he felt it, a chill that cut through the room and caused people to shiver uncertainly. Odin's heart began to race. He had felt this chill before on Jotunheim. Asgard had waged a long and fierce war with the Ice Realm. But a truce had been made years ago. There was no reason for Odin to think Jotuns would be in Asgard. Still. Shaking off the feeling of dread, Odin continued. He was just about to say the final words that would make Thor king when the banners hanging from the ceiling suddenly iced over. There was no denying it. Frost giants, Odin whispered. A growing chill. After leaving so Thor could prepare for his entrance, Loki had made his way to the front of the throne room. The warriors three, Volstag, Fandral, and Hogan, were already at their places of honor, along with Lady Sif. The four were Thor's lifelong friends. Together they had gone on many adventures in which Loki had taken only a reluctant part. The room had grown crowded and was filled with muffled conversation as everyone eagerly awaited Thor's arrival. But first Odin appeared, seated on his golden throne, spear in hand. His expression showed pride and perhaps a hint of sadness as he looked out over the room. Loki felt a pang, wondering if Odin had ever looked that way at him. Shaking off the thought, he focused on the door again. Where is he? Loki heard Volstagg mutter. I'm famished, and Odin will not be happy with the delay. Turning, Loki gave him a look. The huge warrior was always hungry. I wouldn't worry, he said softly. Father will forgive him. He always does. Then, as if in response to Loki's words, the room erupted in applause. Standing at the opposite end of the throne room, holding his hammer high above his head, was Loki's brother and the future king of Asgard, the mighty Thor. As Thor knelt in front of Odin, Loki watched his expression unreadable. Today everything would change. For better or worse, he could not tell. Would Thor be a good king, a wise king, or would he be a rash and foolish one? There were times Loki doubted that Thor was ready. He didn't listen and he was quick to judge. Would Asgard benefit from such a leader? Watching him now as Odin spoke the words his own father had spoken to him thousands of years before, Loki had to admit Thor looked like a king. Odin had just gotten to the final part of the ceremony when a chill filled the room. Loki shivered and rubbed his arms. Trying to ignore the feeling, Loki turned his attention back to Odin, who hadn't stopped. But then, the banners that hung from the high ceiling suddenly crackled. Upon his throne, Odin's expression grew serious. He seemed to know exactly what was causing this strange phenomenon. Frost giants, Loki heard him hiss. And then, as he and everyone else watched in shock, Thor stood up and ran from the room. The warriors three and Lady Sif followed. Sighing, Odin went after them. Loki turned and looked at his mother. What is going on? he asked. I have no idea, Frigga answered. But I suggest you go and find out. Odin ordered the guards to be on alert and then followed the chill out of the room. Thor was ahead of him, charging down toward the vault, the deep labyrinth where Asgard's greatest treasures and direst threats were held under the protection of the Destroyer. He had a very good idea about what the Frost Giants were after. 
the Casket of Ancient Winters. The casket enabled anyone who held it to create a never-ending winter. Laufey, the Jotun king, had wanted to use the casket to turn all the realms into frozen ice lands that he could rule. Years earlier, Odin had taken the casket in order to ensure it would never be misused. For the safety of all nine realms, he had it placed in the vault. Although it was guarded at all times, someone must have gotten in. When he arrived at the vault, his assumptions were proven true. He found Thor with Sif and the Warriors Three staring at the remains of a great battle. Two Asgardian sentries lay on the floor, frozen solid. Towering above them stood the Destroyer, Odin's deadliest weapon. It was a suit of armor three times the size of a man, animated by the mystical Odin Force. When a threat to Odin or Asgard was felt, the Destroyer would awaken, and the Odin Force would burn bright, laying waste to anyone or anything that got in its way. The Jotuns, who had found their way into the vault, had not survived to find their way out. Now, the Destroyer held the Casket of Ancient Winters in its hands. Thor turned, and his eyes met his father's. While Odin's eyes were troubled and resigned, Thor's blazed with unabashed fury. This was an act of war. While up above a room full of the most important people in the Nine Realms had been celebrating, the vault had been broken into and two sentries killed, all of Asgard could be at risk. Something had to be done. Odin watched as various emotions played over his son's face. He knew Thor was angry and that he wanted revenge. A part of him wanted that, too. If Laufey had sent the Frost Giants, it meant that he no longer valued the truce. On the other hand, if Laufey hadn't sent them, and the rogue Jotuns had acted on their own, then Odin might be starting an unnecessary war by retaliating. To Odin, the more troubling question was how the Jotuns had gotten into Asgard. With the all-seeing Heimdall stationed at the base of the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge connecting the Nine Realms, it should have been impossible for anyone to enter unnoticed. The Jotuns must pay for what they've done, Thor shouted, interrupting his father's thoughts. They have paid, Odin said softly. The ultimate price. Thor didn't care. He was burning with a desire to avenge this insult to Asgard. This is an act of war! The king shook his head sadly. He had hoped Thor would think rationally about the consequences. I have a truce with Laufey, Odin reminded Thor. He just broke your truce, Thor said. We must act. Odin turned to Thor's friends. Leave us, he commanded. When he was alone with his son, he asked, What action would you take? Thor puffed out his chest. He knew exactly what he would do. March into Jotunheim as you once did and teach them a lesson. The casket of ancient winters belong to the Jotuns. They believe it's their birthright, Odin said, his voice heavy. And if they had it, they would lay waste to the Nine Realms. This was the action of but a few doomed to fail, Odin said. We will find the breach in our defenses, and it will be sealed. As king of Asgard, Thor began, and Odin lost his patience. But you're not king yet he roared. Father and son stared each other down for a long moment. Odin knew Thor thought him weak, but Odin had the well-being of Asgard to consider. Thor thought only as a warrior. Under no circumstances would Odin permit Thor to travel to Jotunheim. It would solve nothing and most certainly send the realms into war. Thor was not ready for such a war, and Odin feared he was too old to see it through. Thor looked as though he might challenge his father. His face was hard and his eyes glittered with anger. But without saying anything, he turned on his heel and left the vault. Alone with the dead sentries and the bodies of the Jotun warriors, Odin felt his limbs begin to shake. He was uneasy and unsure about Asgard's future and about his own health, and that frightened him. Thor stood in the banquet hall, stewing over the argument with his father. No, he was not king yet, but it was his birthright, and he was not going to let a few words in a ceremony stand between him and protecting Asgard. His brother and his friends were there, unsure how to speak to him in the midst of his rage. 
Finally, it was Loki who took the first step toward Thor. If it's any consolation, I think you're right, he said. About the frost giants, about Laufey, everything. If a few of them could penetrate the defenses of Asgard once, who's to say they won't try again? Next time with an army. Yes, exactly, Thor said. He was glad his brother agreed. But there's nothing we can do without defying father, Loki pointed out. Thor considered this. He looked out the banquet hall window over the splendor of Asgard. Then he looked down at Mjolnir. Loki saw Thor get a gleam in his eye, the kind of gleam he got when he saw a chance for battle. No, Loki said. Stop there. I know that look. It's the only way to ensure the safety of our borders, Thor said. We're going to Jotunheim. Fandral was usually up for anything Thor proposed, but this idea stunned him. What? Sif was more serious. Thor, of all the laws of Asgard, this is one you must not break. If the frost giants don't kill you, your father will, Volstag added. Thor didn't care. He knew this was the right thing to do. My father fought his way into Jotunheim, defeated their armies, and took their casket. We'd just be looking for answers. It is forbidden, Sif warned. Thor spread his arms and brought his brother and his friends close to him. My friends, trust me now. We must do this. There was a pause. Then Loki said, Yes, of course. I won't let my brother march into Jotunheim alone. I will be at his side. And I, Volstagg said. Fandral nodded. And I. Hogan, a warrior of few words, nodded as well. The warriors three fight together. I fear we'll live to regret this, Sif said. Volstagg rolled his eyes. If we're lucky. All they had to do was get past Heimdall, the guardian of the Bifrost. He had the gift of seeing anything that happened anywhere in the Nine Realms. He would certainly be ready for them. As the watcher over the Bifrost, he was sworn to be loyal to Odin. If the Allfather had forbidden travel to Jotunheim, Heimdall would prevent Thor and his friends from making the journey. But Thor had to ask. Loki wanted to take the lead and convince Heimdall to permit their voyage, but Thor had no patience to wait. When they reached the gateway to the observatory where Heimdall stood his endless watch, Thor strode forward. Heimdall, may we pass? he asked. For a long moment, Heimdall just stared at them from under his heavy golden helmet. When he spoke, his words were slow and careful. For ages have I guarded Asgard and kept it safe from those who would do it harm, he said. In all that time, never has an enemy slipped by my watch until this day. I wish to know how that happened. Thor nodded. This was good news. Heimdall would let them pass even though it was against Odin's rules. Then tell no one where we've gone until we've returned, Thor said. Thor walked past Heimdall. The rest of the group followed. Loki looked irritated that he hadn't gotten his chance to speak. Volstagg couldn't resist needling him a little. What happened? Volstagg joked. Your silver tongue turned to lead? Get me off this bridge before it cracks under your girth, Loki snapped. Volstagg and Fandral laughed. Be warned, Heimdall said as the group passed him. I will honor my sworn oath to protect this realm as its gatekeeper. If your return threatens the safety of Asgard, Bifrost will remain closed to you. He let them think about that for a moment. If the Bifrost did not open to them, they would be stuck in Jotunheim, surrounded by a huge army of angry Jotuns. The thought sobered them all. Except Thor. I have no plans to die today, he said. Heimdall did not smile. None do, he said. Heimdall inserted his sword into the lock that controlled the Bifrost, opening and closing the pathways to the Nine Realms. The Great Observatory, a clockwork sphere that channeled the energies of the Bifrost, began to spin. 
All is ready, Heimdall said. You may pass. Thor, Loki, Sif, and the Warriors Three stepped up onto the platform at the center of the observatory. Soon the Bifrost would appear there, allowing them to travel instantly to any of the Nine Realms. On the outside of the observatory was a long, narrow cone. It turned and aimed toward Jotunheim. A beam of rainbow energy shot out from it across space and became the Rainbow Bridge. Couldn't you just leave the bridge open for us? Volstagg asked. He looked nervous. He always was before a possible fight. To keep this bridge open would unleash the full power of the Bifrost and destroy Jotunheim, Heimdall said. The Bifrost could remain open only long enough for a group to go across it. Its energies were too powerful to contain if it stayed open for too long. Ah, never mind then, Volstagg said. Thor started toward the Bifrost. At the edge of the bridge, he stopped and looked back toward his friends, grinning. Come on, he said. Don't be bashful. What Loki Saw Loki watched all that happened in Asgard. He might not have had Heimdall's gift, but he knew what happened in this realm. He saw and heard many things that others did not, and he made his own plans. He could watch unobserved because he was the second son, the forgotten son. All eyes in Asgard followed Thor. Loki also heard and saw things a little differently than other Asgardians because it was a gift of his to alter the way others perceived the world. Call it illusion, call it persuasion. Either way, the result was that Loki made sure he always possessed information other Asgardians did not. This was his true power, just as Thor's true power lay in his limitless courage and strength. He considered everything that had happened since the discovery of the Jotun attempt to capture the Casket of Winters. Odin had been clear Thor was not to act upon the Jotuns, but Loki knew that his brother would not accept that command. Thor was not one to wait patiently, as he made clear by raging through the banquet hall before Loki and the warriors three could calm him. His brother was pacing up and down, his long strides echoing like thunder off the walls. The Warriors Three and Lady Sif had just entered the room, their faces worried, when suddenly Thor walked over to the long table that had been set for his celebration dinner. He flipped it over as though it weighed no more than a feather. Food and drink went flying and dishes clattered to the ground and glasses shattered. The room grew silent. Oh, this food, Volstagg said, eyeing the remains of a large cake. So innocent. Cast to the ground, it breaks the heart. Thor shot him a look so cold that Volstagg took a step back as if he had been hit. Glancing around the room, Volstagg's gaze fell on Loki. He nodded at Loki as if to say, Can you please do something about your wild brother? Loki doubted there was anything he could say or do. His powers of persuasion were known throughout Asgard. But Thor knew him well enough to know when Loki was trying to talk him into something. Even so, he felt he ought to try. He walked over, reaching out a hand to comfort Thor. It's unwise to be in my company right now, brother, Thor said. Already Loki had seen the light in Thor's eyes. He knew that look. It meant Thor would not be satisfied without a battle. This was not good. Not good at all. While Thor might have been willing to risk the wrath of the king, Loki wasn't so eager to do so. He had spent too many years trying to get his father's attention, and he didn't want what attention he finally did get to come from a foolish idea of Thor's. His brother's next words confirmed his fears. We're going to Jotunheim, Thor stated. It's madness! Loki cried, catching the attention of the others who had been standing apart from the brothers. What's madness? Volstagg asked. Nothing, Loki answered, shooting his brother a look. Thor was making a jest. The safety of our realm is no jest, Thor said, walking over to his fellow warriors and filling them in on his plan. We're going to Jotunheim. As Thor tried to convince the others, Loki moved to the side and listened. Why did he always seem to get into trouble because of his older brother? 
Wasn't he supposed to be the wiser one? Odin had expressly forbidden that they enter Jotunheim. Yet it wasn't the first time Thor had done something reckless, and it wouldn't be the first time Loki was powerless to stop him. Anger shot through him. Did Thor not realize what could happen if they were caught? Or worse, if they did go to Jotunheim and were overwhelmed by the frost giants, they would be realms away. Who would save them? Loki had already set his own plans in motion to save Asgard from the threat of the Jotuns. He could not have Thor ruining them. Perhaps he ought to make use of his other gift, the power of illusion, to make people see what was not there and blind them to what was. Not yet, he thought. Not yet. Sighing, he turned back into the conversation to hear Thor say, My friends, trust me now. We must do this. Then he turned to Loki and raised an eyebrow as if to say, You are in, are you not, little brother? There was no choice. I won't let my brother march into Jotunheim alone, he said simply. Loki had made a decision. True, he could not dictate his brother's actions, but that didn't mean he couldn't continue to make plans of his own. As the others checked and double-checked that they had everything they would need for their journey to Jotunheim, Loki slipped away. When Loki rejoined the others, they were on their way to the observatory. Hogan gave him a curious glance, but he ignored it. What he had done was none of their business. We must first find a way to get past Heimdall, Thor said. That will be no easy task, Volstagg observed, trying to get his bulky body comfortable atop his horse. It's said the gatekeeper can see a single dewdrop fall from a blade of grass a thousand miles away. Loki tried not to roll his eyes. Heimdall was not nearly as powerful as Volstagg claimed. He couldn't be, or else how had the Jotuns managed to sneak past him? It would take a person with true power to make that happen. That was the type of person Volstagg should fear. Fandral seemed to agree with Loki's thoughts. And he can hear a cricket passing gas in Niflheim, he said, his voice teasing. Forgive him, Volstagg cried, raising his eyes to the sky. He meaneth no offense. The others were still laughing at the big man's even bigger superstitions, except Thor, who took no notice. Loki's brother was single-minded. All he could think of was teaching the Jotuns a lesson. Within moments, they were through the tall gate that surrounded the royal city. The observatory loomed before them. Behind it, the dark cosmos spread out, a black sea of twinkling lights, which made the domed building seem to float in the sky. When they arrived, Heimdall was waiting for them. Leave this to me, Loki said, eyeing the intimidating man whose face was nearly hidden behind a gold helmet. Good Heimdall, Loki began to say. The watcher over the Bifrost held up a hand, silencing him. You think you can deceive me? he asked, and Loki took an involuntary step backward. How much did Heimdall know? He opened his mouth to protest, but the guard went on. I, who can sense the flapping of a butterfly's wings across the cosmos? Volstagg eyed the others knowingly. Turning to Loki, he teased. Silver tongue turned to lead. Loki glared at him. Get me off this bridge before it cracks under your girth, he retorted. Once again, Heimdall held up a hand to silence them. You are not dressed warmly enough, he said, causing Loki to breathe a sigh of relief. So that was what Heimdall knew, that they were going to attack the icy realm of Jotunheim. Heimdall must have heard about the attack in the vault and was anxious to figure out how the giants had slipped past them. With a nod, the group followed Heimdall to the observatory. Loki looked up and around at the large domed ceiling, its sides covered with carvings and glittering with an unnatural bronze light. As they all looked on, Heimdall walked over to what appeared to be a large control panel in the middle of the room. He lifted up his sword and plunged it deep into the device. The room suddenly filled with a pulsating, vibrating energy, the Bifrost. Turning, Loki saw a large opening on the side of the observatory. Beyond it, the cosmos spread out. Heimdall plunged his sword even deeper into the device. 
and the bifrost energy quickened, coalescing into a vortex of spinning rainbow light. It shot out into the darkness, creating a link with Jotunheim. All is ready, Heimdall said. You may pass. Loki hated Bifrost travel. The way the portal sucked and pulled you apart until you feared you would not recover, the shock and cold as you were sucked between realms, and the knowledge that when the Bifrost closed behind you, it might not ever open again, trapping you far from home. Still, he had no choice. The plan was in motion, and this trip was part of it. As Thor stepped up and disappeared into the vortex, Loki paused and looked back over his shoulder as if he could see into the palace. Turning back, he walked up to the portal entrance and took a deep breath. One more step and he would be sucked into the swirling rainbow. They were on their way to Jotunheim. And what would happen once they got there was not in the hands of fate, but in the hands of his impulsive brother and his warrior friends. Loki would not be able to manipulate events there. He had to trust that the arrangements he had made would be enough for them all to survive. The Power of Three Volstagg had never been this cold in his entire life. Or hungry. It wasn't natural for one not to feel one's nose or lips or hands or even eyeballs. And it certainly wasn't natural for him to hear his stomach grumbling over the sound of the wind howling. No, it was entirely wrong. As was this godforsaken journey to Jotunheim that he and his fellow warriors had been talked into by Thor Odinson. Usually Volstagg would be up for any adventure. His giant size was matched only by his equally large appetite for food and excitement. And he had been at Thor's side on many a journey. It was his rightful place as a member of the Warriors Three. He, Fandral the Dashing, who in Volstagg's opinion was a bit too attached to mirrors and his own reflection, and Hogan the Grim, who was certainly grim, you couldn't argue with that, were famous throughout the Nine Realms. Poems had been written about the mighty band of adventurers in Nornheim, songs had been sung of their trips to Midgard, and tales had been told of their many conquests of both lands outside the realm and women. And they were all true, well, most of them, at least the ones that other people told. Volstagg himself believed that a bit of embellishment could go a long way. But unfortunately, he was not embellishing now. It was cold, and he did not want to be in Jotunheim. Lifting his head slightly, Volstagg felt the sting of ice against his cheeks. He did his best to glare at Thor, who walked ahead of him, seemingly unaffected by the temperature. Volstagg tried to raise an eyebrow, but his eyebrows were frozen, so he fumed instead. They shouldn't be here. Odin Allfather had expressly forbidden his son from traveling to Jotunheim. But Thor did not take kindly to orders, and he certainly didn't take kindly to having his home invaded, which the Jotuns had done, on the very day Thor was to become the new king of Asgard. Jotunheim had slowly decayed until it was now nothing but a world of melting and cracking ice populated by angry and bitter frost giants. Still, their king was strong, and Asgard could not chance starting a war with them. That was why Odin had forbidden Thor from trying to take revenge, even if he didn't like it that his realm had been invaded. They couldn't risk a war. Thor had raged, furious about being kept on a tight leash, if the day had gone according to plan, he would have been made king, and as king, he would have been the one making decisions. Volstagg could have predicted what happened next. Thor had turned on the charm to get the Warriors Three to help him. My friends, he had said to the Warriors Three, Lady Sif and Loki, when the group had gathered in one of the great banquet halls, have you forgotten all that we've done together? Thor turned to Hogan, undaunted by his grim expression and crossed arms. Thor was used to seeing the silent man with a scowl on his handsome face. While others quaked at the sight of the warrior who always had his large spiked mace by his side, Thor was never daunted, even on the occasions when he should be, such as now. Still, he went on, 
Who led you into the most glorious of battles? He asked Hogan, who gave a measured nod in response. Thor approached Fandral, who was relishing his own reflection. And who led you on adventures so dangerous that female admirers and adoring fans continue to follow you around to this day? Fandral flashed his winning smile. It was you, my prince, Fandral said, proud of his exploits. Then Thor walked over and put an arm around Volstagg. He had to reach up, as Volstagg was one of the few Asgardians taller than Thor. With his other hand, Thor patted Volstagg's large belly. And who led you to delicacies so succulent you thought you'd died and gone to Valhalla? You did, Volstagg said, his stomach growling. Thor smiled smugly. Finally, he turned to Lady Sif. She was, as always, wearing a long sword across her back, and he knew all too well that there were more weapons hidden in her armor. While she was one of the most beautiful women in all the realms, her beauty was matched by her expert sword skills. No one dared mess with her. No one except Thor. And who proved wrong all who scoffed at the idea that a young maiden could be one of the fiercest warriors this realm has ever known, he asked. She raised one perfectly arched eyebrow, and the corner of her mouth lifted up in the barest hint of a smile. I did, she said simply. The others let out a nervous laugh as Thor nodded. True, he admitted. But I supported you. Then he turned back to the rest of the group. My friends, trust me now. We must do this. And so they did. A piece of ice hit Volstagg in the cheek, bringing him abruptly back to the situation at hand. Once more, he cursed the frost giants for ever making this trip necessary. Beside him, Fandral looked equally upset by the situation. The charming warrior hated to be anywhere he needed to cover his face, and he really did not like being far from women and a nice flagon of ale. Hogan walked a bit ahead. Volstagg couldn't tell how he was feeling, since the man looked as grim as he did on the sunniest of days on Asgard. Thor was still irritatingly cheerful. It feels good, doesn't it? He shouted over his shoulder. To be together again, adventuring on another world. Is that what we're doing? Fandral called back. What would you call it? Thor asked, sounding honestly perplexed. Freezing, Fandral replied. Starving, Volstagg couldn't help but add. Silence fell over the group as they continued to trek across the frozen wasteland. How could anything dangerous come from this realm? Volstagg wondered as he walked. It seemed completely abandoned. Occasionally they would pass what might have been a house or small village, but the buildings had long since fallen into disrepair, and only the faintest skeleton of a frame could sometimes be seen through the ice. Volstagg felt an involuntary shiver that had nothing to do with the cold. This realm had once been one of the mightiest and most feared of Asgard's enemies, but now it seemed pitiful. Had Odin really caused such devastation? The casket of eternal winters seemed a heavy price to pay looking at the realm now. Perhaps the frost giants were right to want it back. Volstagg shook off these thoughts. It was not his place to wonder. He was here to help Thor confront Laufey, and it looked as if that was about to happen. They had arrived at the central plaza of Jotunheim. As soon as they walked into the plaza, the wind died down and the eyes stopped pelting their faces. Cautiously, they took off the hoods that had been offering them a bit of protection and raised their eyes to scan their surroundings. Each warrior kept a steady hand near his weapon in case of ambush. But they seemed to be alone. The only noise came from the walls that creaked and melted around them and also from Volstagg's labored breathing. Fandral shot him a look. Could you keep it down, he said. Or would you like them to know exactly where to throw their ice spears? They would just need to see your shiny hair to know where to aim, Volstagg replied. How much time did you spend brushing back those lovely locks of yours this morning? Ten minutes? An hour? Hush, Lady Sif hissed. Both of you, I don't think we're alone anymore. And she was right. Volstagg felt the hairs on the back of his neck rise as, out of the shadows and from behind the crumbling columns, frost giants appeared. 
Their blue skin looked as cold as the rest of the planet, and they were very, very big. Even Volstag looked small next to them. As they stepped into the light, he noticed that each giant had a different build. One of them had a large, wide, domed forehead, while another had one arm that hung longer than the other and tapered into a very narrow hand. What is your business here? One of the giants hissed. Thor took a step forward, and in a choreographed move, the giants took a step forward as well, tightening the circle around the Asgardians. I speak only to your king, Thor said, his strong voice bouncing off the walls. Then speak, another voice replied from the shadows of a balcony above them. Volstag narrowed his eyes as he tried to make out the speaker. He caught a glimpse of a long, lean giant slowly making his way to the foreground. There was a slight stoop to his shoulders, which indicated that he might be old, but his voice was still full of pride. This must be the Frost Giant King. As if in confirmation of Volstag's thoughts, the giant stepped forward out of the shadows. I am Laufey, he said, king of this realm. His voice crackled as he spoke, like the ice that melted and broke apart all around him. Volstag had heard many tales of the famed king of the frost giants, mostly from Thor and Loki, who had heard Odin's stories growing up. He knew the king had no fear of battle. His fierce fighting style was second only to Odin's, and over the years he'd lost many Jotuns to battles among the various realms. Seeing the king now, Volstag could believe the stories. Despite the state of his realm, Laufey looked noble and far too proud to reveal the giants had suffered at all. I demand answers, Thor called up to the king, obviously unconcerned with the giant's reputation. How did your people get into Asgard? The house of Odin is full of traitors, Laufey said cryptically. Turning, Volstag exchanged a confused glance with Fandral and Hogan. Traitors? What was Laufey talking about? Asgard had no traitors. Thor apparently agreed. His grip on his hammer tightened and he took another step forward. Do not dishonor my father's name with your lies, he cried. Why have you come here? Laufey asked rhetorically. To make peace? No. You long for battle. From the look on the king's face, Volstag guessed that the giant would be happy to oblige. As if on cue, a few more frost giants stepped into view. This was not good. Lady Sif seemed to feel the same way. She shot Loki a look, hoping Thor's younger brother would take the hint. He needed to say something. Now... Loki, who had been rather silent up until this point, nodded. He walked over and put a warning hand on his brother's arm. Stop and think, he said, trying to reason with his hot-headed brother. We are outnumbered. Thor dragged his gaze, which had been fixed on Laufey, away from the balcony. Shaking off his brother's arm, he looked around. For the first time, he seemed to notice the frost giants. Perhaps his brother was right. Perhaps it would be wiser to leave now. Still, he had come here for a fight. Looking over, he eyed the Warriors Three and Lady Sif. They were all shaking their heads, and he could easily read their looks. They wanted to leave, too. With one last glance at Laufey, Thor sighed and turned to go. Behind him, Volstag said, Thank Yggdrasil. Then Fandral laughed softly. Perhaps this is what Thor's father had meant about being wise and patient, Volstagg thought. True, they had not taken revenge, but they hadn't caused irreconcilable damage either. And then one of the frost giants spoke. Run back home, little princess, it said. A few more minutes, Volstagg thought. Why couldn't that giant have waited just a few more minutes to say something? Volstag saw Thor lift his mighty hammer. Slowly and with a heavy sigh, Volstag drew his axe. Hogan clutched his mace, and Lady Sif pulled out her double-bladed sword. Reluctantly, Fandral reached for his sword and held it in front of him. Volstag had to stifle a laugh as he caught his friend checking out his reflection in the blade's smooth metal. 
The Asgardians then formed a circle around Thor. Above all else, they would protect the prince. It seemed the Jotuns were intent on protecting their own as well. They reached down and touched the puddles of chilled water at their feet. Instantly, the water traveled up their limbs and onto their bodies, freezing into weapons of various kinds. Volstagg saw the giant he had noticed earlier with an arrow hand. The ice froze over his lean limb, creating a sharp spear. The giant with a round head now had a mallet-shaped one, which he could ram into objects or Asgard warriors. Another stepped in front of Fandral and created a sword and spiked armor out of the water. The ice glinted and sparkled dangerously. I'm hoping that's just decorative, Fandral said. But it wasn't. The battle was on. The sound of clashing metal and ice filled the plaza as frost giants and Asgardians faced off. Volstagg sighed as the mallet-headed giant raced at him. As Volstagg stepped to the side at the last moment, his aggressor ran right by him and crashed into a wall. The palace shook with the blow. Maybe next time, Volstagg said merrily before turning to another approaching giant. Beside him, Fandral ducked and weaved, his sword swishing through the air as he confidently dispatched giant after giant. Despite the overwhelming odds, he seemed to be having a good time. Even Hogan looked pleased, or rather at least a little less grim. Out of the corner of his eye, Volstagg watched Hogan face off against one of the giants. Hogan was clearly winning when the giant suddenly managed to back him up against one of the walls. He pulled his sword arm back, ready to strike. Hogan raised his mace high over his head, embedding it in the wall above. As the giant plunged forward, Hogan swung up and over him. Then in midair, he pulled the mace out of the wall and landed behind the giant. With one swift move, he knocked the Jotun, now unconscious, aside. But the Jotuns kept coming. Volstagg knew the giants needed to be stopped soon. The longer the battle continued, the worse the odds. The treacherous frost giants outnumbered them. To overtake them, the Asgardians would have to do something bold, something daring, something only the Warriors Three were capable of. Fandral seemed to be on the same page as Volstagg as he yelled out, What move do you think? Volstagg stepped out of the way of an approaching Jotun and then used his giant belly to knock him over. I say we use the Norn's revenge, he shouted back. At this close range? Fandral replied, swiping the frozen arm off one of the giants. I think the Alfheim lunge is a better move. Volstagg paused. The Alfheim lunge? It could work, perhaps. But it was rather embarrassing. And they had done it only that one time. Just as his mind started to drift back to that day, a blast of cold air startled Volstagg into the present. The Alfheim lunge, as the Warriors Three had dubbed it upon their arrival back in Asgard, was indeed a useful trick. But they were in the middle of a heated battle. It did not seem the time. Volstagg was just about to ask Fandral for another idea when Hogan rushed past him. Shut up, he ordered, and fight. Volstagg took an involuntary step back and had to duck as a frost giant swung a large block of ice at him. Hogan never spoke in battle. It was one of his rules. So if he was breaking it now, they were in far more danger than Volstagg had thought. Swinging around with his sword in hand, Volstagg sent the giant flying into a deep crevasse. Then he turned and held his weapon at the ready. Across the way, Fandral continued to dodge and weave as he took out more Jotuns. Right outside the plaza, Lady Sif was holding her own, her shield raised and her sword swishing back and forth so fast it was almost impossible to see. Glancing behind him, Volstagg saw that Thor was busy defending himself as well. A circle of giants had formed around him as though he were in an arena, and they were each waiting their turn to fight him. His hammer swung wildly, crackling with light and energy. So far, the tide was on their side, but that could change any minute. The giants kept coming, and the Asgardians had no backup. It was going to be a difficult fight. Turning back to the Jotuns in front of him, Volstagg let out a mighty roar and charged into the fray. No, now is not the time for the Alfheim lunge. That was a move to use another time, in another battle. Today, they just had to survive.